Okay, uh, welcome everyone to uh, the first uh, meeting of uh, the first OAF inter meeting. So, uh, again, uh, let's go to the while, well, not well here. So, um, obviously, this uh, applies here. Uh, so, if you're not familiar with that, not well, please make sure uh, to get familiar with this because this is. Um, uh, applicable to everything that we do at the ITF, including this uh, intermeeting. Uh, so this is, is going to be uh, the first of uh, seven intermeetings that will be starting today and every Monday uh, until April 26. So today, uh, the first one is DPOP, and Brian will uh, will walk us through this. Um, uh, and, and there are, you can see the list of um, upcoming uh, meetings uh, and the topics. Um, if you have any other topic that you want to discuss, please uh, let us know, uh, and we will try to accommodate that. Any questions about any comments about the list, this list of interim meetings? Okay, good. So I'll then hand it to um, Brian, so he could um, go through uh, his presentation. I. Did I share or I, I wasn't sharing? Was that what? Did yeah, you your, see my slide, guys? Your slides are yes, yes. Are moving. Yes. Okay. Um, Let me see if I can just take control here. Hey, Fab, um, for the meeting minutes, could do you want to post the list of future meetings in there so that when we share it with the rest of the group, everyone sort of has this as a sure. record? Sort of stuff? Sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You can do that. Oops. I don't know how to use preview. Okay. Are my slides showing up for people okay? Yes. All right. Well, uh, I'll get started then. Um, I'm sorry not to see you all in Prague last week, but uh, doing this from the basements of our home online will have to. Uh, have to suffice. So, uh, as Fat mentioned, here to talk about uh, the DPOP draft. And um, yeah, with that, I will get started. Um, maybe. Sorry. Apparently, I don't know how to use preview. There we go. So, just real quickly, what I want to cover today is um, a review overview of the draft and its contents. It'll be probably a re review for many, but I find it's helpful to kind of level set and, and recover kind of the, the working aspects of how things work to help facilitate the discussion later on. And then I want to basically look at, consider a path forward for a couple of open issues that have been sort of lingering over the, the draft and the email archives and so forth for a little bit. So that's really it over um, just how everything works, what it looks like, and then talk about um, really just these two major issues, not major, two outstanding issues I'd like to uh, Try to come to agreement on a, a path forward and get a new draft published. So, with that said, here we go. Um, so, reviewing is what we're doing here. DPOP, what is it? What it isn't? Um, basically, it is a pragmatic application level sender constraining of access and refresh tokens. And it works by binding a key pair controlled by the client in a trust on first use style way. Um, it is not an HTTP signature scheme on its own. It's not a client to authorization server authentication mechanism as we traditionally think about those. Um, and it's certainly not perfect or an infallible solution. It's sort of a best effort at, at providing some application level sender constraining. Quick overview of how it works. Basically, we introduced this new construct called a DPOP proof, which is a JOT sent as an HTTP header. And it's sent basically on every request to both the authorization server and the resource server, every direct request. And it attempts to demonstrate a reasonable level of proof of possession in the context of that particular request itself. This proof is sent the same way with the same syntax and semantics for both requests to the um, AS token requests, as well as to protected resources, API requests. Um, the AS uses the proof to bind the tokens with it, which it issues um, to that key, and RS uses the proof to verify the binding in those tokens, in the access tokens. Here's what it looks like. The proof, again, is sent as a, as a header with, unsurprisingly, the name DPOP, and it is just a jot. Uh, this gives a look into the inside of one of those jots. 
Uh, it's explicitly typed. Um, it only supports asymmetric signature algor uh, excuse me, algorithms because this is uh, heavily reliant on the, um, you know, the, the properties of uh, asymmetric key pairs where the public key can be shared, but you need to prove possession of the private key, which you keep private. The public key itself is included in the header um, of the JOT, and this is the public key which by we're, we're proving possession or the client is demonstrating possession of this public key by signing this JOT itself. Um, within the body of the request, there's a few things that basically minimally bind this DPOP proof to the HTTP request that it's being sent on. There's a unique identifier which can be used for some limited replay protection and checking. There's the method of the HTTP request, and there's the overall um, uh, URI that the request is being sent to uh, with query parameters, fragments, other things removed, just the, the path scheme and uh, authority. And then there's a timestamp of when this particular proof was issued, and that allows for these to be only valid, only received by the receiving party for a limited time, relatively small limited time relative to the, the creation time of the proof. And it is a jot, and we specifically do say that other stuff could go in here. There is some work or look at this in, in some other contexts that are adding pieces to make it more like an HTTP signature scheme. Uh, potentially, but the, the primary goals of DPOP itself are just to, to use limited signature over, use a signature over a limited amount of the HTTP request, not the whole thing, to prove possession of the key, not to ensure integrity of the overall request. But there's sort of built in extensibility here that would allow for that kind of profiling in, in downstream protocols. Um, when you're making an access token request, the uh, DPOP header. The DPOP proof is sent in the DPOP header of the request, and otherwise the um, the, ac uh, yeah, the access token request to the token endpoint looks pretty similar. And that allows the authorization server, assuming everything checks out, to bind the access token that is issued there to the public key that was in the proof. That, um, that binding can be indicated back to the client with the token type of DPOP. Um, telling the client that indeed that, that token was bound to the DPOP public key and the proof that it sent. On uh, refreshing an access token, it works much the same way. The uh, DPOP proof jot is sent in the HTTP header along with the normal content of the uh, refresh token request. Uh, the authorization server has metadata that it can use to advertise support for both uh, DPOP in general, as well as specific algorithms that it supports. So this DPOP signing out value supported is a JSON array containing a list of the J JWS algorithms supported by the authorization server for the DPOP proofs that it will accept. And probably um, ES-256 is a good choice here, but this allows for some um, dynamicism in the algorithm supported and some negotiation between client and server by publishing this value. An DPOP bound access token, which is issued, the draft basically covers two scenarios. One is, uh, or doesn't cover, it codifies and describes how this would look in the context of a JOT self contained access token or any access token that would be um, dereferenced and introspected, and then describes how that payload would look for the confirmation in uh, JSON on the access token or uh, introspection response. And the current draft states basically that the confirmation claim, the CNF claim, carries the SHA-256 JWK thumbprint of the DPOP public key to which the access token was bound using this J JKT um, member of the CNF claim. So really all it's doing is taking a hash of the DPOP public key and embedding it in the access token, but, uh, but for introspection and JOT access tokens, we describe sort of the syntax and semantics of what that looks like in the token itself or, de or by, by reference. Later on, protected re resource requests are made with the access token that was issued. Here we're showing a reference style access token, but one that is, is bound to the public key um, and presumably would be figured out via introspection uh, mentioned in the previous slide. 
but that token then is bound to the key in the proof, which is also sent via the normal mechanism here, the DPOP header um, and the DPOP proof being sent in there. Um, and then the, the protected resource would then check both the validity of the proof. Does the signature match up to the, to the, um, the key that was in there? Does it, is it properly bound to this particular request? And if so, then check the binding between the access token and the public key within the proof. Um, there's a couple of challenges to find um, that allow for a little bit of negotiation and error handling. Um, one would be a response to a protected resource request without a token. So if a request was made without a token, this would be a normal 401 indicating um, uh, how access could be achieved and this is basically saying the the authenticate uh the depop scheme uh the realm uh per is like the realm in in any other uh challenge as such and additionally we define the uh alex parameter here which is a way for the um protected resource to advertise to clients which depop signing algorithms it supports. In this case, we're showing uh, ES-256, PS-256 basically saying it can be a little bit curve or uh, PSS RSA style. Um, and then a response to a protected resource with, um, with a token, but one that is invalid. These are very similar, by the way, to the, the bearer um, uh, error responses, but with the addition of the, the augs to indicate support for which augs there are. Uh, similar, we've got the scheme, the realm, and then the error messages, which describe both um, human readably and hopefully more programmatically what, what's wrong. You see invalid token and a longer one there saying that, hey, this the, the key binding of the DPOP key is invalid in this case. Um, so that's a quick, <laughs> ugly, dirty, dirty look at the details of DPOP. Um, so I wanted to give a little bit of a status update here and list all the changes that have been published in the new draft since the last interim, which you'll notice is nothing's actually been published since then. You might be wondering why. Um, and basically coming out of the last interim, there were three main topics that um, at least as an editor here, I perceived as needing to be looked at or wanting the, the working group to try to drive to some kind of consensus on. And uh, up in the left here are meetings from the, excuse me, minutes from the last meeting. You can see basically a lot of take it to the list, take it to the list, take it to the list. Let's go discuss this on the list. So I did fire off three um, follow-up questions from that, taking these items to the list. And unfortunately, consensus has been somewhat elusive trying to, to achieve there. And not so much because it's been real contentious, but there's been a lot of sort of, yeah, we could do that, or really it's not that important. Um, it, these are issues which uh, the, the cost benefit isn't totally clear. It's not, not real clear to anyone what, which way we should go on these, myself included. So there's been a lot of back and forth on the list. Um, there were a few changes actually made to the draft, largely editorial, um, and not enough, I thought, to warrant a new publication just yet. So I was hoping to get through these items, get to some kind of resolution, either with changes or not, before publishing the next draft. Um, there was one of the three items where basically, uh, in my judgment, the, the list consensus was, this is not a good idea, we don't need to do anything with it. And that was the question of whether to use or profile somehow separately. DPOP as a specific client authentication mechanism. There was, there was pretty, uh, pretty strong or pretty clear uh, vocal support of not doing that at all. So that's been kind of dropped off the list. And there remain these two other issues, which I don't even necessarily have good names for, but this issue of sort of the freshness of the DPOP signature and what the signature itself covers as well as the nature of how we represent the confirmation style and the access token. Right now it's a hash, as I showed in the previous slide. And there's been some legitimate questioning to whether that's the right thing to do or not. So we're gonna to try to rehash or look again at those two issues and see if we can um, come to some better consensus on a, on a way forward. The first one is this um, freshness and signature coverage. Uh, I say for lack of a better for name, because I don't really know what to call it. But the issue is largely that 
uh, malicious cross-site scripting code can be executed in the context of a browser-based client, and this can create DPoF proofs with timestamp values that are good in the future, and then exfiltrate them along with tokens and use those at some future time. So because there's no sort of um, server contribution to the proof itself, there's no real strong guarantee of liveliness or timeliness of the proof itself. So the stolen artifacts can later be used together with the stolen access tokens to protect to access protected resources or even to acquire new access tokens um, completely independent of the client application itself. Um, Brian, this is Mike, could I uh, speak for just a moment in short, because sure. I have to leave in 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, I did some investigation into what Microsoft is actually doing. Uh, yeah. for application level pop for office and other things, which again is internal, but we would like to be able to move to a depop. I learned that we are having a server nonce included in the signature. Now it's the old OAuth. Uh, HTTP signing draft, but we're adding a nonce to it. And the way we get that nonce is sending an unauthenticated request and getting the www authenticate header response back that has a nonce in it. And in terms of your slide about other stuff could go here, I assume if we had a nonce, we would put it there. Uh, that's certainly yes for your own sort of usage. That would be a possibility. Um, I'm curious. Does does that been is that nonce renegotiated for every single request? Okay, good question. I was going to add one other piece of information, which is the way that works is the nonce can be reused, but. Uh, and you could call this a hack or not, but if in the 200 OK response from the authentication, you get back a new nonce, you're expected to use that the next time. It does mean that there's one mandatory additional round trip to get the first nonce, but there's no additional round trips for subsequent nonces. Oh, wow. OK. Um, that's interesting. <laughs> Again, I'm not saying this is the way it would have to be, but I'm giving you a data point that yeah. Microsoft felt that the liveness of the tokens was a big enough security deal that they didn't want malware to be able to mint 50 tokens that were good indefinitely far into the future. Um, and so at least I think if Microsoft was to move this, we would want the ability to have a server contribution, even though we admit it introduces an ex at least one extra round trip. And again, I'm going to have to drop in five minutes, but I wanted to say this and at least put it into the discussion record before I. Oh, that's, that's a useful data point. Thank you. In in that 200, like sort of renewal of the knots, do you know how that's um, uh, conveyed? Like. I, I can find out. I think it's in the body, but I'm guessing uh, this was a late Friday conversation with sure. our engineering architect. And I can, I can send that to the list. Anyway, thank you for letting me interrupt and injecting. Yeah, thank you uh, for, for what it's worth. Mike, Mike and I discussed this briefly on Friday um, as this his uh discussions with internal implementations sort of overlapped with this general question so we were uh, trying to get some clarity on on how some of those things were being done i i think i saw a question here so uh, yeah i think justin had had some comments or question uh no i i was just since mike brought it up i just wanted to uh, talk about the op pop draft and uh, the old one and HTTP message signing, but I can wait till the end of Brian's presentation. I don't need to jump in now. So just if I can just hang in the queue till then, please. Okay. Yeah, sure. Although, I, yeah, it may well be relevant. Um, 
I mean, the, the short version is that that draft was always intended to be much more of a general flexible solution, uh, whereas I've always seen default as a more sort of point solution. So my gut says that that's probably the direction that, uh, that uh, extensions like this, a lot of extensions like this should go in. Um, even though I think it's important to ask these questions of, you know, are, are there any sort of easy bits to cover in Depop uh, that will actually have a positive impact without making it too complex? Yeah, agreed. Fair. Um, all right, let me uh, let me try to repick up here. Basically, so th this slide does talk a lot about um, site scripting as a vector of of like executing code in the client context, but where you could potentially use the APIs that have access to the key without actually stealing the key itself. And so I think cross-site scripting is the, the most likely candidate for that sort of thing. But as Mike mentioned, the potential for, for some kind of malware on the client um, would be another potential way that that kind of access to mint tokens, mint proofs, use the key, but not actually steal the key might, might be a, a vector for that. Um, and so the, the current situation is that, that we have this issue that, which is meant to be a timestamp of when the, the token was itself issued. And this is helpful on the server side for preventing, you know, reuse or limiting the, the time during which a token would be accepted. But the nature of, of how this works does not, um, you know, could be pre-computed by an adversary pre-minting tokens with IAT times in the future is, is possible that by the kind of adversary that we're talking about here, one that has access to use the private key but not steal it directly, this largely all comes down to the fact that there's no server contribution to the DPOP proof itself, as well as the fact that the token itself, the, the access tokens and refresh tokens are not covered by the DPOP proof. Um, which was really is, is not sorry, I say it's not because of that as well, but that including a token might be one way to sort of pseudo include some level of server contribution because it's something that that's issued by the the authorization server. So including that in the proof somehow would limit potentially the scope um, of of use of the proof in a way that doesn't rely on an individual nonce or challenge um, as, as Mike described being done uh, in Microsoft. Um, I will say that not having a challenge response type protocol for the proof itself was, was an intentional design choice um, aimed at trying to keep simplicity and, and less overhead for the, the overall protocol itself. That doesn't mean that choice was the right one, but it was intentional trying to keep things simple and trying to keep them relatively efficient, at least in terms of round trips with the with the various servers. Um, so coming back to this, some potential options, ideas, of ways forward. Uh, the first one is, is that it's okay as is. It's sufficiently all right as it is, leave it as it is. Um, there's some discussion in the draft right now about the possibility of this happening. Um, and describing key rotation as a uh, recommended means to reduce the impact of such a uh, attack. So if pre-computed proofs were made, you know, using a particular key, but that client um, rotates keys over time. And in a lot of ways, Depop um, keys can be not, not fully ephemeral, but they can be relatively short-lived. You could um, create and use new keys largely you know, for, for the scope of a single um, authorization um, and then start with a new one. So that key rotation is, while not built directly into the protocol, one way to, to really limit the impact of the kind of attack we're talking about here. And all this kind of builds on the fact that any attack vector that allows for this kind of pre-computation of proof and use later offline or away from the client itself um, certainly allows for a direct use already. So defending against the sort of pre-computation offline use is nice in some ways, but it doesn't protect against the actual usage and attack carried out online while access to the key is available. 
So there's, I think, some question then whether there's really worth the, the effort and the complexity introduced in the specification to, to sort of close off the offline attack scenario while the online attack scenario is still possible. Um, and one that that can't necessarily, or at least I am not aware of any way to, to directly close that off. If you have access to the the key to create things and you can execute that functionality on the client, you can go ahead and make requests and carry out whatever attack it is directly from the client. So there's really nothing we can do in the protocol itself to mitigate that. And if that's a possibility, then again, I'm repeating myself, but is it really worthwhile to try to close off one variant of that same attack um, when the full access is available another way. I don't know. Uh, I kind of think it, it gets hard to move that way. But So um, some other potential ideas are one that's come up quite a few times is incorporate some aspect of the access token, probably a hash, into the proof itself, uh, potentially with, with other tokens or codes as well. But this would give sort of a, a semi-limited aspect of freshness to the proof because it's only good for the duration of that particular access token itself. Or to try to go um, all the way, I guess, and allow the server to somehow provide some sort of non-slight contribution to the proof itself. Uh, and as I said previously, this is, you know, the, the protocol itself was designed uh, intentionally to try to avoid a challenge response in this kind of area. So it, it feels a little bit awkward within the current design, particularly um, there's differences in what sort of mechanisms are allowed for the AS and the RS to convey um, additional details in the response. Um, Mike mentioned previously that he thinks maybe the you know, the new knots is carried in the body of, uh, of a response, but that becomes really problematic for APIs and resource servers where the, the body of requests and responses are completely, um, you know, application level uh, designed for whatever that API is. So we'd have to find some other way to, to stuff a nonce into, um, into a challenge in a way that, that fits with sort of all the protocol layers and then, uh, as sort of previously mentioned, the challenge per call, it certainly feels untenable to me. So we need to devise some kind of um, schema to amortize the cost of a challenge response over multiple requests. Um, and, but then that leads me to ask, how does that work exactly? Is it not really a nonce? Because that means used only once, but maybe some sort of um, temporally relevant server contribution that could be used for some period of time defined by the authorization server or resource server, um, maybe, or is there some sort of um, scheme, Mike sort of described as potentially a hack. Um, sometimes hacks are clever, sometimes they're really hacky, but that during the course of normal operations, you could continue to sort of um, update the, the server contribution through um, successful requests, maybe in some additional header. I don't know, I honestly hadn't thought about it much in that way. Uh, seems nice for a single client, but also sort of problematic for a, a client that's making multiple requests through different threads to, to the same resource server, keeping track of those challenges and correlating them between requests seems, I don't know, potentially problematic, but maybe I'm not thinking about it well enough. Um, and certainly, I'm sure there's other uh, solutions or, or approaches that I haven't thought of um, just because that's the nature of things, but also because Mike already discussed one that, that I hadn't really thought through previously. Um, I hope that gives some idea of sort of what we're looking at here. Um, and my proposal for a path forward coming into this, um, but it is just that, is sort of let this, uh, what I've jokingly tried to call uh, cross-site scripting nihilism, go ahead and prevail. And I think uh, the last comment on the list about this sort of sums it up pretty well. It, it, if this is already game over, if, if cross-site scripting is already facilitating full access, it's probably not necessarily worth it to try and to patch one particular scenario uh, with a hash. Um, so this would mean no protocol changes, but some editorial changes in 
Uh, actually, Daniel's already written some of these up and, and put them into the editor's copy of the repo, which you don't need to read here on the right, but additional editorial changes describing the potential for the attack and, and some mitigations in the form of key rotation or, you know, general suggestions that, that even with this protocol in place, um, everything in your power needs to be done to prevent um, cross-site scripting and, and other similar types of attacks. Um, So yeah, that, I guess that's uh, that was my feeling or recommendation uh, working on these slides last week. Uh, I'm not sure that necessarily represents how we're feeling um, from a consensus of working group here, but but that's where we're at. So uh, maybe table that for the moment while we talk about the other one. So do do you want to table it? Do you want to take? Um, you know, um, what time, what time? Well, or we can dig into it now. I, yeah, let, let's let's see if anybody has a, any com comments or questions or thoughts. I, I just want my mention. This is Francis here. Uh, I just want my detail. Uh, uh, Brian, you work on uh, an extension you wanted for HTTP signature, but I personally think that extension is exactly what you need here. To make DPOP solid and uh, limit the attack space to the replay. Remember uh, Shimp or however you call it with this? Yes. Um, I think that is the extension you need. I, I suppose one could argue that that's another solution not mentioned in the options or ideas here. And just to give some context really quickly, SHIMP is uh, an acronym for Simple HTTP Message Integrity Protocol, I think. Um, as far as the DPOP request is concerned, it really amounts to the inclusion of the digest of the body being included in the request and thus sort of giving some level of integrity protection over the whole thing. One could think of that as adding a lot more context and entropy to the request, which would make pre computation a lot harder. But ultimately, if the uh, goal of a, an attacker was to pre, -comp pre compute um, some sort of content to carry out an attack later, the uh, content of the attack would be the, the message body of the API requests themselves. And so they would be in a position to um, pre compute that as well. So I don't actually think the kinds of measures in something like uh, a shimp or, or full HTTP signatures by themselves um, provide uh, anything with respect to this particular problem and at the same time uh, introduce a lot of complexity. Uh, which I'm strongly trying to avoid at this layer, which is keeping this particular document about the proof of possession itself and not trying to um, not trying to and actively trying to keep a, a strong separation of layers and keep this from becoming a, a, a larger HP signature type of scheme because it um, it doesn't seem like it, but the minute you wade into that territory, it gets massively more complicated and a lot harder to deal with. Okay. Um, Justin. Yeah, uh, plus one to everything that Brian's saying there. Um, you know, the uh, the problem, I said this in the chat here, but the problem with HTTP message signing is is not the actual signing the bits, it's uh, figuring out the bits to sign. Yeah. And so saying things like, oh, just add a body hash uh, is great until you realize that people can make HTTP GET requests that don't have a body. <laughs> And so that same get request is going to be the same all the time. Um, my personal preference for DPOP would be to, and Brian and I have talked about this, would be to have just a very simple, very statically defined uh, access token hash as an additional header with some discussion about that. Because I think that that's, a, that's an easy, simple add to this um, that that doesn't get into the normalization of HTTP messages. Right, it's the, the second second point there yeah. on the right. Um, so personally, I think that that's a, that's a very small jump and 
I mean, even like just make it recommended, you know, make it a should instead of a must on calls to the RS or something. I don't know, but the rest of the, the rest of the Depop structure stays the same. And that's, that's important. Like the simplicity and the parallelism of doing the same thing when you talk to the AS versus the RS based on the information that you have, I think is a really good thing. I think the inclusion of the access token does fulfill some notion of server nonce, although it's not, it's not perfect. Um, you know, I think that is helpful. And on top of that, um, I am working with Annabelle Hackman on a, um, on a general purpose HTTP message signature spec. So, uh, and I'm, I'm actually meeting with her later this afternoon. Um, and it's our goal to progress that to, uh, RFC sometime, um, hopefully this year, but we'll see. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, no, no, I hear that. <laughs> that's, I, I don't disagree with the, uh, with the chuckles. Um, but. Uh, but no, so we're, we're actually making, uh, more, more progress recently. Uh, I actually hope to have another draft of that out at the end of this week, um, that addresses some things. So when that is, uh, has gone through like one or two more immediate pushes, uh, I would actually like the OAuth working group to pick up the general purpose OAuth pop draft based on that. And as I have said all along, I think that there is, uh, Perfectly reasonable space between DPOP uh, to, to allow both DPOP and the HTTP message signing POP uh, exist together because DPOP solves um, a small solution in a very elegant way with like, a lot of complexity. Message signing is really, really hard to get right, but it pays off for those uh, who want to be able to use it um, and because of all of the problems that it does solve. That Depot is not trying to solve. Ultimately, it's all a decision trade-off space, and so I like to see us have things within that space. Okay, hey, Francis. Uh, here again, I I think Justin uh, Depot should be by no way a replacement for HTTP signature, and we have discussed that enough. But uh, Depot, the way I understand it, is to prove possession of the key. And not only proving possession of an access token or proving possession or whatever. That is why, if you want to protect the access token, the access token hash makes sense. If you want to protect a request, that request hash or digest makes sense. Uh, you cannot solve the problem of a future uh, projection of a request because uh, some attacker that has access to the key now and compute something for the future, the only way to protect us. Uh, like Mike said before, is having a round trip to the server. It, 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 it's about theoretically keeping it simple like you want, but also keeping it open enough for reuse for other purpose. Access token hash, great. I can protect the access token by putting the access token hash there. I can protect another request by putting the whole request digest there. You can put that in recommendation. But that is not a replacement of the HTTP signature, of course. But I find the solution that Brian drafted elegant to limit the attack space. It won't solve all problem, but it shall be considered. Thank you. Okay. And so somebody, there's lots of noise coming from someone. I don't know who that is. Please go on mute. Hey, Hannes. Yeah, I, um, it's great to hear that uh, there, there's good progress with the HTTP signing, as uh, Justin just mentioned. And initially, when the work on Depop was kicked off, it was supposed to be a really quick solution that people can deploy right away. Um, but now, like sometime in, it almost appears that like uh, the Depop, uh, the, the, the HTTP signing that Justin is working on might uh, might be faster in in getting finalized, or am I am I seeing this wrong based on what Justin just said? Um, Justin, do you want to reply to that? Um, I was muted while I was laughing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> if HTTP signing is faster than Depop, we are doing everything wrong. Um, <laughs> like a general purpose HTTP signing has lots of corner cases. That uh, that we're shaking out of here, right? Like, um, and uh, I, I I think it, like Depop should should remain simple and extensible. 
Um, I think in an ideal world, we would have had HP message signing a decade ago. Um, and uh, I think with the, the standards like the HTTP group and the security community are finally in a space where we can actually make that happen. Um, but, uh, but I think that there is still very much value in Depop, especially because Depop also serves the, uh, or answers the question of how do I associate the key? Right, because that's something HTTP message signing doesn't do. Um, and so uh, Depop has a very simple, consistent way to do that within the space of OAuth 2. And I think that there's a lot of value in that. So, uh, you know, if, if, the, if the consensus is to just take Depop as it is and publish it with that, I'm actually okay with that. Like I said, I'd like to see a, a hash of the access token. I think it would, I think it would help. But if we don't see it here, we'll probably just very quickly see extensions like Shimp uh, and uh, and other specs that are using it say like, okay, here's how you hash the access token. Put it there, register it, go on with your day. Yeah, I think just to add to that, I, I do think the HTTP signature stuff is coming along better than maybe anticipated in the HTTP working group, but I would be shocked if it's actually faster than this, particularly because um, it is hard, as, as Justin mentioned, when you get around all the edge cases. And even once that's done or close enough to be done, largely OAuth will need some profile thereof or some instructions about how to use the HTTP signature and bind that against the access token and, and do those things. So there's there's additional work that will need to be done, worthwhile work, but I don't think the, the timelines are such um, as you sort of ask that they might play out on us. I, I think this could be done um, significantly and, and yeah. be usable. Unfortunately, we lost Hannes. We had to, oh. to drop. So, Oops. can you get somebody else to take notes? Anybody? I've been taking some backup notes, but I can continue. Awesome. Thank you, man. Appreciate it. Okay. So, uh, Go ahead. I was just going to say, you know, I think this this discussion um, belies some of some of what I've been struggling with um, about a, a path forward with this. Is it's not there's a lot of different opinions about what could and should be done. Interestingly enough, none of them are super strong. Um, like Justin's um, advocating for for doing the hash here, and I certainly like. Even though I've got a proposal not to do it in the next slide, I'm I'm pretty minimal to that too, as it it feels like potentially a relatively simple way to address some of this and has some benefit as well, um, because it does give it's not a full sort of liveness server contribution, but it it emulates a lot of that functionality and covers things for a future beyond when this sort of um, online offline attack might be carried out. A, a full challenge response doesn't do anything to the online attack anyway, nor would the, the hash of an access token, but it does prevent um, really further out um, pre-computation. And in, in that sense, it might be a good sort of middle ground trade-off in terms of protection and simplicity. Um, so I'm, but, but we seem to be, we maybe me seem to be stuck in this. Well, yeah, maybe, maybe we should do this. And I, I don't know, to be honest. Um, I could certainly go for hash. I could go with this um, do nothing. I'm not sure. Um, but I, I yeah. yeah. <laughs> but uh, I, I don't want to be in this. I don't, I, it's definitely at least partly my fault. I'd, I'd rather not be having the same conversation again in, in six months. I'd love to, to come to some kind of consensus here and, and try to move things forward. Because yeah. despite these outstanding couple of things, I do think we are really close to being able to publish something that, that's um, usable and, and implementable right now. Okay. Uh, I'm going to cut the line after Dennis here. So, Dennis, uh, right? Thank you. Uh, well, I sent uh, three mails on uh, December the 2nd, and I proposed some text. And obviously, since my comments were made under version 2, and there is no version 3, none of my comments have been incorporated. I would like to insist on a very important comment. Um, 
Ryan mentioned that he wanted a clean layering and he wanted BPOP to work with basically only keys. Well, if we want to make BPOP more secure than it is, this is not really possible. Uh, there is a case of the collaboration attack where you have an illegitimate client that is given by a legitimate client both an access token and a DPOF proof token. And basically, if you give this token and if it incorporates the name of the person or an identifier of the person who gave you the token, this may limit the attack or this will limit to impersonation attack only. So I would say that normally an access token should include either a sub claim or other claims allowing to unambiguously identify the user to the RS. In this way, the RS may say, oh, it's coming from this user. Well, I'm talking to another one. There is something wrong. So I don't accept this token, even if everything is correct from a cryptographic point of view. That's it. Okay, uh, thanks, Dennis. So, although this is not really related to this specific issue that that Brian was talking about, right? Um, okay, so um, like I guess I don't know. I, I want to try to get the feeling of the of the room here, or or the the the, the people on in in here. So. Uh, we're trying to to make a decision. Do we want to like maybe I'll uh, I'll ask a question first about um, if you are in favor of not doing anything like exactly what what the uh, um, what the slide is talking about right now. Just leave the document as is, uh, or you wanna you wanna incorporate either um, that um, um, that uh, a mechanism that kind of helps with that replay attack. Whether it's a nonce or something else, that's a different story. We can discuss it later on. So, so I'll, I'll, I'll ask the question and see how many people are in favor of leave, leaving it as, as as is, as presented in this slide. So, if you are in favor of leave, leaving the the document as is, um, please add a, a plus one to to the chat there. Did you mean also add the editorial stuff, but? Don't change the protocol. Correct. Or don't do no. anything. Correct. Yes. Okay. So don't change the protocol. Add the caveats in uh, security considerations or whatever. Correct. Okay. Okay. Now, okay. I have give you. Let me take this. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay. Sorry, Anybody don't else? count mine. Say that again. I said sorry, don't count mine. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Seven. <laughs> okay. So I think I saw it. Yeah, I, I, and Tony, I saw your, okay, and eight, I think, now with, with there are two more now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah okay, now, yeah, I, I was just waiting for people to, <laughs> to leave there. I think I, if I counted correctly, I have eight in favor of leaving it as is. Now, if you are in, in favor of changing this, and including a, a replay protection. It doesn't matter what mechanism. For, we'll discuss the mechanism later on. Please plus one now. I have no concern with the replay mechanism because the attack I mentioned is possible without any replay. The first person gives all the, all the cryptographic values to another one, it's not a replay. But could we please keep the focus on the particular yeah. issue at hand? Yeah, let, let's focus on this one for now. Okay, so. so. Yeah. 
yeah so it's justin did you did you vote for both i don't know <laughs> yeah this is the itf i can vote as many times as i want <laughs> okay just wanted to make sure <laughs> so yeah. actual voting yeah uh, oh, hey, sorry. I mean, this yeah. is this this is a realistic view of my sentiment um i yeah, yeah. would be okay with us going both ways i i do have a preference for a very simple access token hash uh and i think brian and i are in the same boat so gotcha. i i would i hate volunteering that. myself to write text but brian maybe you and i can um can write a really simple access token hash pr um because I I don't think it would actually take much. Um, I I'd be happy to work with you on that. Thank you. the The actual text is less of my concern, although I could always use help writing anything. Right, um, exactly. It's just it's trying to get to consensus there, and like I said, it's weird because there's <laughs> it's yeah. not super strong feelings either way. But I think it's important to to move forward. Yeah, but I, I don't see a consensus here, though, right? So, yeah. I, I, Francis, I, I think uh, we should really split it in the general protocol that's very powerful the way it is now, and then an extension part that can give adopters the possibility to either add access to Kunash or something else. Those extra security measures should be put in a separated block. If not, if we just lock it with the access to Kunash by reducing the extent of the use of this protocol, um, Brian, we have about five minutes. Do you want to cover the other topic? Yeah, you... let me, let me like... try. Yeah, so just right. at least at least introduce it, so maybe you can yeah. take the other step to that. <laughs> it's already been on the list, but I'll try. Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> so the other one. What, what is... was our final? What was our vote on the other one? That is, like I didn't see any consensus, say Tony. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so the other one is um, it's it's been suggested that on resource access, having the JWK and the header of the proof itself makes it much too easy to just use that key to validate the signature and maybe miss checking the binding to the access token, which might lead to just sort of careless accepting of that and not actually getting any of the value of this protocol. Um, this was compared to the AUG none world of JOT, which I try to humorously say is the worst hyperbole in the history of time here, but I don't think it's quite that bad. But I do think potentially it, it is a problem. In that current situation is we've got the full JWK in the proof. The hash of the JWK is in the access tokens confirmation, and potentially this is a problem. Um, although there's only one person really strongly advocating for this, um, I think it's a, a pretty reasonable point. Um, we've got two options. One is leave it as it is. Uh, the other is to move the full job, uh, full JWK in the access token confirmation and then omit it from the proof on resource access. Um, and this is less error prone and also avoids the need to actually define the hash function for the confirmation. So my proposal on this one is to remove that foot gun, put the full job JWK in the access token confirmation and admit it or make it optional on the proof um, in resource access. Uh, real quickly, I tried to show a diff of what that would look like. Basically, the proof would take that JWK out of that line, move it over to the confirmation you see here on the access token, and then the JKT with the hash of the um, uh, proof or of the public key in the proof would be removed entirely. Um, I, I think this makes sense from a security point of view um, and is a rel it is a change, but is a relatively small change. And it actually, once done, means there's less bits being conveyed all over the wire. It's hard to really say what's more and more efficient with various caching schemes, but in general, there's less stuff being carried across the two artifacts here. So it's a, it's a net win in that sense as well and um, does make the particular security um, mistake um, much, much more difficult, almost impossible to do here. So I, I would say my, my suggestion here is to go ahead and, and make this change. Yeah, okay. We have two minutes here. <laughs> two minutes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anybody has a strong, why I have, okay. Philip, yeah, go ahead. Just, just one point that when whenever we would put these uh, JWKs in the access token, um, this might be a stretch if we actually, or if anybody actually uses RS, um, RSA for this signing, the access token jaw just becomes massive. 
um, because the, your your whole modulus and everything uh, um, is is uh, then part of the access token, and you may run into limits if part of the query or something. So, but it's not a big deal. Most people uh, are I mean, using ES anyway. You should be, and the, it, it's moving it from one place to the other. Um, and it's potentially then, if you were using RSA in the old style, you might have problems with the size of the proof. So I'm not, uh, it's really just moving around the size. True, when, when you consider everything goes in a header. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Justin, I, and I'm gonna cut the line off. I, I think that's the last one. Yeah, go ahead, Justin. Hey, uh, I see the point here, but I personally don't like it because it breaks the parallelism, which was one of the, as Brian pointed out, um, yeah. and, and that is one of the nice and very elegant things about Depop and adds a lot to its simplicity. Uh, this is coming from someone who has implemented this both client and server side on a couple of different platforms and language stacks now. Um, that parallelism buys you a lot okay. from a developer perspective. Okay, uh, what since you are uh, uh, any okay. any last minute <laughs> thoughts, uh, Brian? Uh, no. Okay. Um, no, just to throw this last slide up here. Probably won't see you all in San Francisco, but it would be nice. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully, the one after that. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe the one after that. <laughs> okay. Thank you guys. Appreciate it. Brian. Great, great presentation. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you guys. Appreciate it. Thank you. Bye.